Renewable energy? I'm a big fan. How to generate electricity is something that uh, you could be asked for on exams as far as a qualitative idea. Um, they don't really do so much quantitative here. So it's important just to understand the general concept here. Uh, that's why I'm going to go over this. So first of all, how do we actually get electricity? How do you actually get it? Well, first you need an energy source. So maybe I'll put that in. So I'll say uh, energy source here. And if we do the energy source, there are lots of different sources of energies, right? There's Steam, obviously that's just uh, heating up water. There's fossil fuels like coal or whatever, you just sort of shovel it in there. Again, you heat it up. So this will here, this will be in the form of sort of, you're gonna heat things up, so will this. Turns out nuclear, although it sounds really complicated, you're just using it for its heat. Uh, wind power, there you're just gonna actually, uh, that's just gonna be kinetic energy, so EK. Uh, wave power is also going to be kinetic because you're going to turn some sort of fan and hydroelectric is also going to be kinetic. Well, it's not exactly true because they're all kind of kinetic, in fact, uh, because what ends up happening is in all of these cases, the goal is to turn a turbine. And what a turbine is, um, just imagine a wheel, you know, you know, with some sort of spokes on a wheel or something like that. And at the end, you just put some magnets. This is all you need to do is have magnets. Uh, Oops, not magnetics, magnets. So over here too, and over here too, and over here too. Basically, wherever you want to here, you just put magnets on the end. And what you do is, as long as they're rotating, that's what this idea of turning a turbine. So somehow you have to turn a wheel. And the reason is, uh, well, in physics SL, you don't really need to know the exact uh, reason, but in HL you do. It's actually called Faraday's Law. And it turns out, I mean, I may as well just explain it very, very briefly here, because I think it's a shame not to learn how the idea works. Is that, um, imagine around a magnet, let's just say you have a north, south right here. You've got these magnetic field lines. Remember, we are learning how to draw them in another chapter, right? So, so we've got all these magnetic field lines here. And what happens is this, if you have a material, um, and let's just say I have a coil of wire right here that's being wrapped around this material here, and this right here could go to, oh, I don't know, whatever, it could be a light bulb in this case. But it could just be attached to a light bulb. This is the idea, is that as long as you have um, magnetic field lines that are crossing this object, we call that um, magnetic flux linkage, it turns out. But as long as you have these, imagine these magnetic field lines, and imagine that they're crossing this material here, in this case, this uh, little coil of wire that's wrapped around a piece of metal. There's no battery needed in that one. What happens is this, as you have the magnet and it's sitting right there near that coil, if the magnet's not moving, sure you have these flux lines that are crossing it, but they're not changing, so actually nothing happens. But what happens is this, if you move the magnet around, it doesn't matter how you move it, as long as it moves in some way, then you, it turns out you induce an EMF. In, in other words, you induce uh, electricity to flow. This is actually called Faraday's Law. It turns out it's formally defined as uh, what we say. The induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage. Although that sounds really complicated, what it really means is if you have these flux lines that are crossing and changing as they're crossing this object, in this case, this coil of wire, as long as they're changing, you're going to induce a current to flow. And then in HL, we learned that if you want to know which direction it flows, you apply Lenz's law, which tells you that it'll flow in a way to oppose the current, uh, oppose the motion in some way. So the idea is this then. Imagine, uh, I mean, a simple example is on my bike. For example, I actually have this installed on my own bicycle. So if you imagine on the front wheel of my bike right here, this is the, uh, I guess the fork. You'll see I'm not a very good artist. And I've got my front wheel like this right here. And attached to it, I've got this little coil of wire basically. So inside, this is basically, it's got a little light right here. And basically I've just got it attached there and it's just like this, it's just a coil of wire wrapped around uh, probably a metal, uh, maybe like iron or something like that. It doesn't have a battery in it though. What happens is this, um, attached to this, I've actually attached some uh, magnets to my spoke. So imagine I've got a magnet here and a magnet here and a magnet here and then one that passes right by it right here. Of course I've drawn it poorly, but you get the idea I think. Actually, I'll draw it further out then. It crosses like this. What'll happen is this, as those magnets pass by this little thing, do you see those magnets are gonna end up making this changing, um, you could say this changing um, magnetic flux lines here. So we're gonna change the magnetic flux linkage as it's called. But basically the simplistic idea is moving magnets create electricity. But this is the process by which it does it.
And it turns out that is what gets you electricity. So all of these ones are just about turning a turbine in order to generate electricity. So all of these actually do this step right here. So think about this. For steam, what do you do? You heat up some water. Uh, it turns into a gas. That gas is going to basically be sent in through a pressurized tube. And it's going to have a little wheel at the end, like a little paddle wheel. And imagine you turn that wheel. Guess what the wheel has on it? Magnets. And those are attached to something like this. You get electricity. Fossil fuel, what do you do there? You heat, uh, and oftentimes you heat up steam. So the idea is that the fossil fuel is uh, the process that you're going to use to actually heat up the steam. Then you heat up the steam again, pass that steam through a pipe, turn a wheel, there you go. Uh, nuclear sounds really complicated, and it is, uh, the process by which you sort of control this reaction, but it's just being used for heat. You're just heating up water. Again, you pass hot, you pass a tube of water above all this heat, and that water turns into steam, that steam turns a turbine with magnets on it, then you get electricity. Wind, however, is slightly different. There, you have directly, you have the wind itself is actually coming in here, and it's actually impacting these little blades here. Of course, the wind is going to sort of, you know, deflect that way, and because of Newton's third law, that means that it's going to make this thing want to turn. You know, as the wind goes down, you know, it's going to push this blade up. And it continues like that. So basically the blades end up turning. Guess what's attached somehow to this? You just sit through some gears or something like that. But basically your whole reason is you're going to turn this thing. Guess what's attached to this? Magnets. Magnets turn and you get electricity. Uh, waves, same idea. You could have waves themselves coming in and turning a turbine. It could also be um, tides. But again, the idea is the same. And finally, you have hydroelectric. And you might think, oh, that's really complicated, right? No, you just take, you just harness the power of water. So if you have water flowing down, for example, through a pipe, guess what you attach at the end of that pipe? A wheel. And that wheel turns, has magnets on it. You generate electricity. It's really that easy. So that's really all you need to know from this. As far as nuclear energy goes, I love this picture here, nuclear launch detected instead of a launch, right? It looks like a mushroom cloud, like from nuclear explosions, but it's really just, I think, a pizza that imploded. <laughs> awesome. Uh, but if we look at this nuclear energy, here's what's really going on here. We'll go a little bit more detail into this. Again, remember we had uh, nuclear energy, which turned into thermal, which turns into kinetic, and again, that's going to turn a turbine. This is the idea here. So let's talk about what's going to happen. First of all, you have nuclear energy. In this case right here, um, I mean, you can actually dig this stuff from the ground. You can actually, you know, do a, a big digging project, depending on where you look, and you can find a whole bunch of uranium in the ground. Now, the kind of uranium you get in the ground, you tend to get uranium-238, um, but there's a small proportion of it that's 235. And, and this is one of the magic, magic kinds that you can use, for example. Of course, it's a very difficult process to actually, what we call enrich. What you have to do is, is through some really interesting processes, either through some really caustic, terrible chemicals to sort of leach away the 238 from the 235. You basically want to split up the different versions. Uh, you can use centrifuges, for example, because as you spin around, you know, the heavier ones will be uh, more on one end and then the lighter ones. So you can use centrifuges to do this. We call this enrichment of uranium. But it turns out you need this uranium 235. So the reaction that happens, I mean, there's lots of them. But just keep in mind, there's really a whole bunch of them. This is just one of them. But let's just say you have uranium-235, and you add to it, for example, one neutron. Uh, now, neutron is zero here at the bottom because it has no protons. A neutron has uh, just one neutron plus proton because it has a neutron. Uh, this, for example, becomes lots of stuff. It could be lots of things like baryon and, and this, uh, sorry, barium. Uh, there's a lot of other things plus a lot of other things. But very often, you end up with, like, let's say, two neutrons uh, and of course plus energy because whenever you do this remember anytime you're building new elements you're assembling them from their constituent particles uh, you end up with uh, this released energy because some of the mass goes missing remember we learned about this e equals mc squared business right this missing mass gets converted to energy so you end up with energy which is great but you also end up with neutrons so just imagine this. Then. So you do this reaction here. You get nuclear energy. So you convert nuclear into thermal. Why is that? That's this energy right here that came in. This extra energy is going to be in the form of heat. Also light and other things, but mostly it's going to be uh, temperature. So that's why it's thermal energy. It's going to increase the kinetic energy of the molecules. Now, what you do with that thermal energy, you often run uh, water pipes above it. So imagine then you just got this area that's really, really hot. You pass above it some pipes that just have water in it. And of course, what do you do then? You heat that water in order to, um, in this case here, pass it 
through a little pipe, you make it steam. And again, like we talked about, that will turn a turbine and that will end up giving you the energy that you needed. So this is sort of the process that happens. Interestingly enough though, if you really sort of zoom in a little bit, these fuel rods, which will contain uranium-235 and other things, the way to basically start the reaction, look, you have to kick in a neutron. So imagine then you have your sort of, imagine just like a neutron gun just sitting here. You want to start the reaction. So you throw a neutron into here, pew. And what'll happen, of course, it'll create this reaction. We call it a chain reaction because, watch this, you start off with uranium-235 plus a neutron, you get some stuff, some stuff, some energy, of course, that was the point of it, but you also get, let's say, two, maybe three neutrons from the reaction. Each of those neutrons can then, in turn, imagine then, maybe they can fire off and start off something over here, or maybe fire off something within this. So imagine you start with one neutron and uranium, you end up with two neutrons, you know, and then you end up with four, and then eight. It goes up really fast. That's what we call a chain reaction. Now, if you want to control this reaction, like in a reactor, you don't want to blow up the whole thing. If you want to make a nuclear bomb, of course, that's the goal, is to make an uncontrolled chain reaction. Just let it happen. In fact, throw things to multiply it. Like, you can do things like, um, there's all sorts of crazy reactions, but it turns out with the new ones, um, you know, if you had tritium and some of these other things, it's, sort of, it's almost like a multiplier effect for these uh, bombs. Those are for fusion, uh, no, uh, fission, sorry, no, fusion. So it turns out um, in this reaction right here, fission, we want to control it, right? We want to try to not blow everything up. So what do we do? We have these control rods. They're usually made of things like carbon, things that are going to absorb the neutrons. And the reason we want to absorb the neutrons again is to control them. Imagine this. If you have too much reaction going on, the temperature is going up too much, what do you do? Take your control rods and just throw them down within this. Can you see that? This way, neutrons from, uh, you know, within the fuel rods, they might be able to start these reactions, so it, it doesn't stop it immediately, but at least stops neutrons from flying into other control rods, uh, other fuel rods. Can you imagine that if you have these control rods just slamming down in between everything? They're going to absorb the neutrons and basically control the reaction. So this is really what happens, and you have to be very careful in a reactor that you have really good safety measures. Basically, if anything else, if anything looks weird, basically the, the uh, controls should really be to just drop the control rods all the way down in order to stop the reaction. I mean, that should always be the sort of safety thing. Obviously, maybe if they get jammed or they can't go down, obviously that's going to be a problem. It's going to heat up too much and bad things can happen like in Chernobyl in the 80s. Um, I remember when I was a little kid, we lived in Germany at the time. And when that had happened, basically the control rods didn't work. Uh, through other some there were some other things going on too, but basically it got so hot it basically the core itself melted through its casing and some of these really nasty byproducts of the reaction uh, they ended up going out into the sky and into the clouds and that was really bad news for anybody who lived in the area of course I think there was a town called Pripyat I think it was called that was really heavily affected. Uh, you can see really eerie videos of people biking around in the old town because people just left obviously, um, but. I remember it affected me as a little kid because we lived in Germany. I remember they told us because the, the winds had come west. I remember they told us we couldn't play outside in the sand for a while. They said we actually couldn't have uh, cow milk because they were worried that the cows actually would uh, would have been infected. So there's all these weird things that even affected little old me as a little kiddo. Uh, of course, it affected people in Russia in a very, very real way. Um, but anyway, these control rods are really important for these reactions. Now, why do we actually bother doing this? And if they're dangerous, it's because the energy density is so crazy. It's so crazy high that you get so much sort of bang for your buck, kind of. Uh, you get so much energy for every kilogram. And that's why we use them. Even if they have their dangers and they have their challenges, certainly, uh, you just, we don't have anything with the energy density, and even close to it. So that's why we use them. 